Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in getting started this morning. Uh, today's Bible study is going to be going into Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter number 2. So please turn to the book of Daniel. It, the book of Daniel, of course, has a great deal of prophecy in it, but it is more than just a book of prophecy. There are a lot of life lessons that we can derive from the book of Daniel, and I hope to do that some of that with you today and in subsequent lessons that follow. Before we begin the second chapter of Daniel, though, I'd like to just sort of take a moment and recap Daniel chapter number one. Daniel chapter number one. Now, uh, in Daniel chapter number one, we need to remember just what a shock it was for young Daniel to find himself in the city of Babylon. We want to recap that. When he was taken at captive, he was the first of, of three waves of captives taken from the land of Judea and Jerusalem into the land of Babylon. Daniel was from a prominent family. He found himself uh, um, a prisoner. They did identify him, though, as a man, of, a young man, probably 17 or 18, about that age, of great intellect and talent. Uh, they decided he would be best as a eunuch. All evidence indicates that he was made a eunuch, and so he had that additional shock. Beside being ripped from his homeland, never to return, he had the additional shock of losing his manhood. But we discover in Daniel chapter 1 that he recovered his spirit and his soul and his, his faith in God was strong. We discover that self-pity was not a strong part of Daniel's life. Certainly everyone has their our moments, but self-pity was not a theme that Daniel dwelt upon. We discovered that despite the fact that he had enormous disappointments and limitations that were placed upon him, he was able to still serve God in a powerful way. And that's a lesson for all of us. Despite life's disappointments and limitations that might be imposed upon us, we still have the ability to serve God, and God is used every one of us in a valuable way. You will also recall that Daniel honored the authorities placed over him. It's a great challenge to honor authorities that are placed over us that we did not choose to have over us. Yet that's exactly what Daniel did, and God prospered him in that. And that's a challenge in our lives as well. We discover that Daniel remained rooted in his faith, remained rooted in his identity, he remained rooted in his new geography, the geography that he did not choose. And yet there he decided to make a future and serve God. So with those thoughts, recalling what we can from Daniel chapter number 1, let's begin Daniel chapter number 2. Now chapter 2 is, is a bit long. We're not going to be able to read every single verse in Daniel chapter 2. But it is a story that you are perhaps familiar with. Before we uh, jump into the story in Daniel chapter 2 and begin to look at a few of the verses, I'd like you to introduce, to do, introduce you to a, an important character in the book of Daniel. And that is, of course, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so on the outline, point number one is simply, who was Nebuchadnezzar? Now I want to just get, lay this, punctuate this point. Nebuchadnezzar was an exceedingly powerful dynamic world character in 600 BC. He would be in modern era, he would be up there, we might, you could, the ancient world might, might look at Nebuchadnezzar the way the modern world has looked at Napoleon. He was a world changing figure. He reigned over the city of Babylon, the empire of Babylon, for 46 years, an exceptionally long reign. His father began some conquests. There is some evidence that they might have co-reigned for a short time. But his father died while he was still a relatively young man. But as a relatively young man, still in his 20s, he accomplished enormous military conquests. He was considered, of the ancient world, somewhat of a military genius. And he was responsible for leading all of the Babylonian armies while his father took care of the politics back in the capital of the city. Sometimes he's referred to as a king, perhaps while because he referred to as a king while he was still simply the commander-in-chief of the entire Babylonian military force. So he was this 
very dynamic man. He was he would have been probably brilliant. We don't know. There's no way to test his IQ, but he had to have been brilliant. He had to have been very, very politically astute. He was very prideful. He had a strong element of ego and pride, which often comes with people who are exceedingly successful in everything they touch. But that's Nebuchadnezzar. So as we get to know Nebuchadnezzar, consider this as who he is. Very powerful man, very prideful man, very brilliant man, very politically astute, military successful, and a man who was used to having enormous success in everything he touched. That is you know, this man, Nebuchadnezzar. And he figures highly in this chapter and in subsequent chapters. So let's just keep those thoughts in mind as we learn about this man, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I believe it was 43 years, I apologize. 43 and 43 years. But anyway, 43 and 43 years. All right, so let's look now at this story. Now, we're, I'm, not, I'm going to jump right in, into the story here. And, and instead of reading the first 20 or 30 verses, I'm going to tell you the story. Let's just recap the story. Now, how many of you may remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? I hope you do. I hope if you've read the book of Daniel in recent months or years, uh, you will recall the story of Nebuchadnezzar's famous dream. Now, this dream is perhaps one of the more, more well-known dreams in all of the Bible. It is also a dream in which a great deal of prophecy hinges off the interpretation of this dream. So we're going to dip our toes into prophecy some today, but uh, not as deeply as what maybe one could. But how did this dream come about? All right, so you let your eye open the book of Daniel, chapter 2. As I tell the story, let your eye run through the first 20 or 25 verses. And you can kind of follow along as I just give re refresh your memory to the story of Nebuchadnezzar's famous dream. Here's how it goes. Early in his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He woke from his dream that morning, and he said to himself, Hmm, by golly, that was really a remarkable dream. And he calls in all of his wise men, his soothsayers, his astrologers. And believe me, Babylon was a, was a culture, a city, and an empire known for its men of wisdom, men of astronomical and astrological insight. They were known as mathematicians. All of this was intertwined with Babylonian religious tradition. But these were intelligent, educated, cultured, religious men. He called in. So he calls in the astrologers, the soothsayers, the religious leaders of his empire. They're the capital of Babylon. He says to them, gentlemen, I have a remarkable dream. I, said, I would like you to interpret the dream. And they all say to him, no problem. We're good at that sort of thing. That's just our cup of tea. Tell us what the dream is, and we'll tell you the interpretation. He says, problem is. It's one of those dreams you can't, you know, you forgot what it was. Now, how many of us have ever had that? You have a remarkable dream, and then shortly afterwards, you forget what the dream was. Well, the astrologer said to him, <clears throat> well, we'd love to tell you the interpretation, but you're going to have to tell us what the dream is. We can't tell you the interpret. We can't interpret it unless we know what the dream was. How are we supposed to interpret the dream if we don't know what it was? Then the guy says to him, gentlemen, gentlemen, you are so smart and so wise, and you have all of this religious connection to the gods of heaven, Marduk and all these other gods of Babylon. You should be able to tell me the dream and the interpretation. Now, why do you suppose Nebuchadnezzar said that? Well, there's two possibilities. One, he really did forget the dream. Or two, he knew what the dream was, and he was checking to see if they had as much religious connection that they had as much insight and wisdom and power as they liked to claim. He was going to check them out and see if they could tell the dream. The wise men persisted in saying, we've got to know the dream. We can't tell you the dream. In fact, they said, no man can tell you the dream. We'll tell you the interpretation, but nobody can tell you the dream. You've got to give us the dream. Nebuchadnezzar became angry. He said, 
you guys are a bunch of fraud losers. Just you got you guys are a bunch of fakes, frauds, total. You, you're you're religious and wisdom. Your 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 astrology, your all that stuff. It's a bunch of baloney, and you guys are a bunch of fakers. And if you don't tell me the dream, I'm going to execute every one of you and destroy your homes and families. <coughs> well, that put a lot of fright into them. But yet, they persist in saying, we can't tell you the dream. Of course, they couldn't. They were, what, what must they have been thinking? They must have been, I don't know what they were thinking, but they probably, probably they were thinking, <laughs> what if we take a stab at telling the dream and that's not the right dream. And he really is just testing us. Well, the long and short of it is they say we can't tell you the dream. Well, word percolates now. <clears throat> now, Daniel, of course, and his three friends had been through to the educational system and the training of the, this very institution that the wise men were a part of. And when word percolates now to Daniel, Daniel sends word to a, a man who has access to the king and says, Hey, listen, send word to the king. I think I can handle this situation. Send word to the king that I can help. So word percolates back to the king. Daniel is brought in before the king, and Daniel says to the king, Hey, listen, I, with the help of my God, Jehovah, can tell you the dream and the interpretation. I believe I can do that. I believe with God's help, I can tell you the dream and the interpretation, okay? So you don't need to kill me and all of us and this whole crowd of hundreds or perhaps thousands, we don't know how many, of wise men. And Daniel says, just give me a little time. I've got to have a little time, but I can tell you. The king grants him the time. <coughs> it is speculation on my part. I'm personally convinced after reading this many times, that the king really knew the dream. And the wise men knew, or were suspicious, that he really knew the dream. Which is why they didn't dare take a stab and just make up a dream. Because the king would call them the carpet. Now, why would Daniel, excuse me, why would Nebuchadnezzar have been putting the wise men through this test? Well, you're going to discover as we go through the book of Daniel <coughs> that Nebuchadnezzar was a, as I say, a very prideful man. He was very insightful. He understood the dynamic between religion and politics in his culture. And he did not like the leverage that these religious people placed had in his kingdom. He wanted to remove their political influence. He wanted to reduce these people. He wanted to get them out of his life so that he could accrue all the political influence. He wanted to discredit them. This entire chapter, his entire goal, I'm convinced, was his entire purpose in this whole thing, when he had this dream, when this dream came to him, and it was, the dream did come to him. It was a real dream. It was a real dream sent by Jehovah, I believe. This dream did come to him. But he decided to use this as an opportunity to totally discredit the religious leaders of his society. Not because he was totally irreligious, necessarily. But he did not like their influence in his kingdom. He wanted to accrue all that power and influence to himself. That's my, now that's a bit of supposition on my part. So, this is the story. This is the tale. So Daniel goes home. Goes to his home. And there he spends the evening in prayer. Sure enough, God opens up his heart to Daniel. God shows Daniel the dream. Daniel comes back to the king and says, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm here. I'm prepared to tell you both the dream and the interpretation. And we're going to look at a few passages as we try to draw some clues out uh, and, and some insight into this situation. But before we do, let's let's just jump ahead a little bit now. We're going to dive into the Bible. Kind of, I've given you a summary now of the first 20, 25 verses. And let's, uh, let's, let's look a little bit more. Now, on the handout I gave you there, for those that enjoy these handouts, you'll see that we have uh, two statues that are there. Now, this is just a black and white off the top of the machine, so it's not as good as it was in color. But uh, no one really knows exactly what the statues were like, but these are, each of these statues may be what the dream was like. Okay? 
So the dream was of a, a great statue. So we have Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. There's one image on the left, another one on the right. So it describes this. So let's uh, let's read a few verses here. And we're going to come back to a few of these passages. The verses have already dropped off, uh, passed over. But let's let's just jump into uh, verse 31. Are you ready? Now I'm going to begin reading in verse 31, and we're going to have a look at this dream, shall we? All right. One of the great dreams of Bible. One of the great prophetic aspects of scripture. This really figures pretty large in Bible prophecy. If you're a person that's into Bible prophecy, well, you're going to have to wrap, you're going to have to come to grips with this theme and, and come up with something, some interpretation, some understanding. Shall we begin? I'm going to start at verse 31. Here we go. Daniel 2. Thou, O king, this is Daniel speaking, sawest and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hand, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, so that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So there you go. And he dreamed a statue, a great statue. The statue had four major parts. It had a head of gold. It had a chest of silver. It had the upper, the, the abdomen portion, the it would have been of brass. And then the legs were of iron. And toward, as you approach the legs, the iron began to be mixed with clay. And there it stood until a great uncut stone came flying out of space from somewhere, smashed into the feet, destroyed the feet, and the whole thing crumbled to the ground and was destroyed. There it is. And what's the interpretation? Well, let's go. Now this is where it gets a bit interesting. So let's have a look at the interpretation. All right. We'll begin in verse 37. Let's read a few verses. Thou, <coughs> king, art a king of kings. Now catch that. And this, don't let that pass by. It's too much to emphasize just how powerful and how great a world figure Nebuchadnezzar was. And you might look at that sheet I handed out first. You got that sheet with all the list of all these kings? I've got asterisks by the seat of the great kings of antiquity. Nebuchadnezzar's at the top of that list. This is Nebuchadnezzar II, actually. There was, I think it was his grandfather was the first. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given to thine hand, and thou hast made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, as you can see, began a dynasty of Babylonian kings. He was the greatest of all. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all things shall it break in pieces and Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the king shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So now we've got a description of four kingdoms. Now some Bible commentators mistakenly see five kingdoms here. But as you look at it closely, we see four kingdoms. 
the three are fairly straightforward, and then we see a rather complicated fourth kingdom. But there are four kingdoms, not five. Verse 44, verse 44. And the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. That's a key phrase. We'll come back to that. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. In other words, it will surely all come to pass. You can count on it happening. Now, before we drop into the meaning of the dream, let's consider some of these responses. Now, Daniel, he's had to respond to this situation. So let's back up just a little bit. Daniel's response to the king's anger. You know, I, I kind of wondered, why was the king so angry? You know, why was he so angry that they couldn't tell them what the dream was? Well, that's strong evidence in my view. That this was really a test. He was really a religiously insightful man who understood this relationship between religion and politics. And by golly, he was going to get the bottom of these people these soothsayers and astrologers who claim to have all this religious insight. But let's look at poor Daniel. So Daniel got so up into this thing, and you see that he is given the dream, he's given the interpretation. But look at uh, back in Daniel chapter 2, verse 16. I'd like to call your attention to Daniel's first response. Daniel's first response to the king's anger is found in verse 16. It says, Daniel went in and desired the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now, why was, now notice, Daniel was confident. Confident. Daniel had unique confidence when all the other wisdom and wise men had none. What was the source of Daniel's confidence? It had to be his relationship with God. It had to be his relationship with Jehovah. Now, we could draw a lesson from that in our own lives. Do you have a relationship with God that is such that when you are under pressure, you have confidence that God will give you the insight that you need. Now, you're, now this is a life-threatening condition for Daniel, was it not? He had confidence that God would see him through. Where is your confidence in Jehovah when a life-threatening, many of us will not face life-threatening challenges, but some of us will, that God will see you through a challenge? Where is your confidence? Number two, after God answers Daniel's prayer, we get at verse 19. Let's read a little bit and get a little more insight into Daniel. Verse 19, we're backing up now a little bit. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that no understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light that dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. He is grateful. Daniel is not bashful. He has what, five verses describing, four verses, five, five verses describing his gratefulness to his heavenly Father. Now, is that a big part of your life? Is gratefulness a large portion of your life and your relationship with God? When you wake up in the morning, does your mind dwell upon the things that are going well, or does it immediately rush to the few things that are not going right? All of us have a few things that are not going our right, at a given moment in time. But most of us have a lot of other things that are actually going quite well. And if we could just dwell upon the blessings and the positive and all the things that God has really done for us and allow these to grow and swell in our heart rather than dwelling upon the things that are troubling us 
They're not going so well. Daniel spent five verses in nothing but praise to his heavenly Father, showing his gratefulness for God's power revealed in this time of testing. And third, in, in chapter 28, excuse me, verse 28, Daniel is very quick to defend Jehovah. In verse 28, when he does come and begins his conversation with the king, before he actually gives the interpretation and the dream, in verse 28, here's what he says. Daniel gives his full credit to our Heavenly Father. Verse 28. He says, There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon my bed are these. So Daniel is quick to say, Nebuchadnezzar, you have decided to put a religious test in your kingdom, in your empire. And by golly, I can show you where the real God lies. I can show you that there is indeed a God that reveals secrets. You might be a skeptic, O oh great Nebuchadnezzar, and think that all the Babylonian gods are limited in their power and scope. He probably was a skeptic. But I'm here to tell you that your skepticism in those false gods might be genuine, but your skepticism that there is no God is wrong. Because there is a God that reveals secrets. You're right that these pagan gods can do nothing. But you're wrong in assuming that there is no power up there in heaven that can reveal secrets. So right at the front, Daniel defends Jehovah. Now is that our instinct? When we are confronted with problems of life, is it our instinct, is it our, is it our first reaction to say, I need to defend the God of heaven and his reputation. That's my purpose, that's my design. That was Daniel's response. All right, well, let's continue. Let's go now to the meaning of the dream. We're going to have to kind of move quickly through this. It can be a little complex, but we've read the dream, we've read the interpretation, we see that there are four kingdoms. So let's look at the meaning of the dream. First of all, the dream here corresponds to a dream in Daniel chapter 7. Now, we're not going to read that today. We'll eventually get to Daniel chapter 7, but it corresponds to that. And you can, in your own time, if you'd like, look ahead a little bit. We see that this dream has four kingdoms. The first one, gold, then they have silver, brass, and then the last one, iron, clay. In Daniel chapter 7, there's another dream, that vision is given to actually to Daniel. And of course, the first kingdom, the gold kingdom, corresponds with a beast that rises up. And that beast is a lion. A lion. That's from Daniel 7. The second kingdom, the silver kingdom, corresponds to a beast that rises up, which is a bear. And when we get there, we'll look at the lion and the bear more closely. The third kingdom corresponds with another beast, another wild animal, a leopard. A leopard rises up. So we have a lion, a bear, and a leopard. And now the fourth kingdom. This is the mysterious one. This is the enemy. It is a beast that is described as simply being a dreadful beast with iron teeth. It doesn't tell us if it's a cat or a bigfoot. It doesn't tell us. It's a dreadful beast with iron teeth. That's all it tells us in Daniel chapter 7. And so we, we don't have anything more. Now, virtually, I, in fact, I have not found a single scholar or Bible student who disagrees with the assessment that chapter, the dream in chapter 2 and the dream in chapter 7 describe the same events, the same historic description. So it seems to be universal agreement among all Bible scholars that these two dreams correspond. There is disagreement, though, in a couple areas, but we'll get to that in a moment. Let's go to the second point now. One of the things that is that people get confused on a little bit, I do believe, the dream that is given in both cases is not comprehensive of all world history. Some people assume that this is comprehensive of every empire of note in world history. 
And of course, that's not true. It cannot be true. Certainly, there were several powerful empires equal to Babylon that came before this. They weren't in the dream. Came before the head of gold, the Assyrians, for example. Then there are other empires around the world. For those who are historians, we can talk about there's many great empires. Not all of them are going to fit into this schematic in these four kingdoms. So it's not comprehensive of all world history in my view. And Daniel 2.28 gives us some clues to that when it says, what shall be in the latter days? Now there's a also a, a misunderstanding about the phrase latter days. I probably will throw that out. The phrase latter days actually does not exactly mean only what happens at the end. The word latter days literally means what comes next. What comes next is telling us what's going to be coming next, not merely the very end. Now it may include the very end, but it's not exclusively only the very end. So if you can look that up in your concordance and Greek and Hebrew and that sort of thing, but I believe that's an accurate phrase. Now here's an important point I do believe. This dream tells the history of the Holy Land. It tells the history of the historic period of Israel's dispersion. It's telling us this period of time in which Israel was taken out of the land and then a divorce, covenantal divorce, stripped out of the land, and then they will be brought back into the land at some point in the future, and they, there will be a remarriage. That's the period of history that this dream is telling us. It's the period of Israel's dispersion. Well, let's go a little further on the meaning of the dream. If we look at the kingdoms, there's not that much controversy about kingdom number one, kingdom number two, and kingdom number three. Before we go into that, let's examine kingdom number four just for a few moments. Let us notice that first, each kingdom is inferior to its predecessor. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? You got gold, and then you got silver, and then you got brass, and then you work your way down to iron and clay. The last kingdom is far inferior. Inferior in what ways? Well, you might assume well, that's talking about inferior in wealth. I believe it's more inferior in terms of, it, of being a, a cultural accomplishments and, and it's, uh, it's an overall accomplishment because for those that are in the history, each of the, all of these kingdoms have periods of enormous wealth. So it's not necessarily wealth. The, the, the metals are talking about the, the cultural significance of the kingdoms. Let's go to the next one. That fourth kingdom now. That fourth kingdom was culturally poor. It was earthy. It was destructive. Look at Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. It says that this fourth kingdom it breaks in pieces, it subdueth all things. As iron breaks these, it breaks in pieces and it bruises. It's got a destructive quality. The fourth kingdom is a destructive kingdom. Destructive. That is the nature of the fourth kingdom, this dreadful beast with iron teeth. Let's go to the next verse. This fourth kingdom also is both strong and weak. It is unstable. It's not going to be strong and weak. It's going to have periods of strength, periods of enormous weakness. It's going to be unstable. The fourth kingdom also, that's in verse 41, of the iron mixed with clay. In verse, uh, uh, let's see here. Let me see if I've got this right. Oh, there's another clue. Now, I don't want to give, get too deep into Daniel 7. But in Daniel chapter 7, we get a great clue as to this fourth kingdom. And all of the scholars seem to agree that this fourth kingdom in these two chapters is the same. same. This fourth kingdom in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7 says this fourth beast is diverse. And also in verse 23, again it repeats it, it is diverse. And the word diverse means different. It is distinctly different than the first three. There's qualities about the first three that all seem to have a, a, a similar, similar aspects to them. Then suddenly comes this fourth one, which is a lot different than the first three. It 
is diverse. Finally, in verse 43 of Daniel 2, there's a really powerful clue here. And for those of you who like word games, look at verse 43. It says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, the word mix is a very interesting word. The word mixed in Hebrew is ereb, E-R-E-B. In Aramaic, it's Arab, A-R-A-B. Ereb, Ereb, means mix. Now, when you do a word study, that, 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 I, I find it pretty interesting. Now, I wouldn't mm. say, now look, life is full of coincidence. And those who disagree with what I'm about to plunge into here say, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, it could be. Life does have coincidences. On the other hand, sometimes there are really literary clues that God intentionally scatters through Scripture. And I believe this may be a strong literary clue. It's the identity of this word kingdom. The word mix, meaning you ever heard it. Now, many people, and I'm going to turn the outline on just over, so those of you who want to keep track of where we're at, I'm on the second page now of the outline. There are a lot of people, a majority of scholars, a majority of Bible students in the last couple hundred years, identify the fourth kingdom as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. Now that's rather common. And it's 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 very it's a very dominant interpretation. And from a Western point of view, it makes a little some sense. You say, well, let's think of all the world history, the, the empires of world history. Surely the Roman Empire would surely figure very large in this. But I think there are some weaknesses here. Those that argue that Rome was the fourth kingdom, they have to then argue that the fourth kingdom, Rome, the Roman Empire, was transformed into the papacy, which they do. They argue that. That the Pope, we kind of go from Julius Caesar to the Pope as the head of the fourth kingdom. But then they got to go further. Then they got to argue, and this is how the thinking goes. That it then merges, the papacy somehow merges into what they would call for a short time the Holy Roman Emperor Empire. And then that merges into the modern world, what they now call the European Union. And then there are some who take it the next step further and say that this fourth empire is the United States of America. Perhaps you've heard someone or make that argument that this fourth empire, that we, the United States of America, is this fourth kingdom. And it and we draw a connection. All the way from Rome, the papacy, to the Holy Roman Empire, to the European Union, to the United States of America. So I think that's, personally, I've always wondered about that. I thought, man, that, I know a little about history. That's running pretty loose with facts. You got, you're, you've got a lot of links in this chain that you've got to tie together. you got a lot of links. So I've always wondered about that. And I think that's an unreasonable stretch of historic facts. I think it misunderstands the perspective of Daniel and misunderstands that we need a, an interpretation that's looking at a Jerusalem set of interpretation rather than a European set of interpretations. We need to look at a Jerusalem center, a land of a holy land interpretation, a land where the, the holy land is our, is our lens. And understanding that this dream is all about the children of Israel being taken out of the Holy Land and divorced and eventually being brought back into the Holy Land, we are not regathered as from the United States. As much as I enjoy visiting Europe, Europe is not regathered Israel. Regathered Israel is in the land of promises, in the Holy Land, is the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the land that they trod, in the land that, God willing, you and I will one day tread as well. So let's look at the interpretation now as I see it. The gold head is Babylon. That's easy. It's identified in the chapter. The silver breast is Persia. This can be deduced by kind of looking at other passages in the book of Daniel. No controversies there. The brass belly is Greece. Now, I've given you, and it's not relevant to everything that we have. Remember now, we've got this chart, so keep this... Chart of Kings handy, so that sometimes we pull that back out again to look. And some of these guys have some pretty strange names. Don't worry about the pronunciation, but that's that was their names. Kind of gives a little survey of, of when they lived and how it all how it all unfolded in history. 
And finally, though, after Greece becomes the fourth kingdom, I believe the fourth kingdom is Islam. I believe the fourth kingdom is Islam. And there are some good Bible scholars who agree with me on this. In fact, I confess I'm standing on their research, not my own. I really did not develop this idea. But when I ran into some of this information, I thought, you know, that really is a powerful argument. I just can't, I just can't get aside from it. But I believe the iron legs and the, and the iron legs and the iron clay feet represent Islam. Islam has two branches, of course. You have Shia and Sunni. Two great branches. Representing two legs. Now, if we compare them, let's go back. And on the first page, I, we looked at some of the qualities of the four king, this fourth kingdom. This fourth kingdom is inferior to its predecessor. And the predecessor of this fourth kingdom was Greece. Was Rome inferior to Greece? I say no. Rome was not inferior to Greece. Islam? Is Islam an inferior culture to Greece? I say it is. Was Rome known for its destructive qualities? Well, it was a powerful empire, but it was actually, when you look around, you think about Rome's legacy, it was a great building. It was a, it was a kingdom that is, is an empire that was known for building. The roads of Rome are still used in some places. The Colosseum, the mighty things that they built are still with us today. Islam, in contrast, has been a destructive force that has built virtually nothing. Was Rome unstable? Rome is one of the most stable empires in world history. In fact, its longevity and strength is a mark of its stability, not its instability. Islam has been very unstable. It is one of the most unstable cultures in world history. The people are notoriously unstable. Rome was not particularly diverse. That is, diverse meaning different than Greece. In fact, Rome and Greece are so similar that they are often referred to as the Greco-Roman culture. The gods were the same. The lifestyle was the same. They dressed the same. They ate the same. They lived the same. Rome and Greece were very, very similar. Rome was patterned a lot like Babylon, Persia, and Greece. It was not diverse. It was not different. Rome was very much the same. Very similar. And finally, this business about mix. Rome had limited race mixing. There was some. All empires bring people together, and there was some. Rome had relatively limited race mixing. It was people of the same race that ultimately overwhelmed Rome. It was our people, the, the so-called Germanic peoples, sometimes they refer to them as barbarian, but they were the ones of the same race as the Romans that overwhelmed Rome in the West. <clears throat> Islam course, is a mixed race, and you don't have to really look around very far to see that they are exceedingly, the, the vast majority of people of the Islamic faith, the Arabs, as you will, are mixed, racially mixed, culturally, they're just a tremendous mixed race. Now, so that's my, uh, that's my take on this dream. Now, there's going to be a little more in subsequent chapters we'll dip into here, but I'd like to move on. I don't want to bog down just the Bible prophecy, but I would like to go into now some a few applications as more practical as we look at the responses to the dream. A first question that can be asked as we look into this: Why was the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar? Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a very powerful man, but he's not a believer. He doesn't believe in Jehovah. He's not an Israelite. He's not a Hebrew. He is of the race of Adam. He was Caucasian. Mm. He didn't look very similar, but he dressed. He had, he had no connection to Jehovah in any way. Why did God, if he has such a powerfully important message to the world, and powerfully important message for the children of Israel, give this dream to Nebuchadnezzar? Why did he give it to Daniel? <laughs> Or someone else who was an Israelite. I mean, Daniel would be a fine candidate. Well, he does. Years later, Daniel gets chapter 7. That was his dream. But God gives it first to Nebuchadnezzar. Why? And what would that be of any value to you and I? Well, here's what I think it is. I think there is value in here, understanding this. God often starts 
at the top of an authority chain. That's the way God works, very much in life. God works through authority. Now, our spirit is a rebellious spirit. By nature, every one of us have a little bit of rebellion. Some of us have a lot of rebellion. And we react against authority. Some react against authority so instinctively that you end up with folks, if an authority says it, it must be wrong. That's their knee-jerk reaction. If an authority says it, it's got to be wrong. Have you met someone like that? If an authority says it, it can't be right. Anything is right. He's got to be lying and manipulating and conniving. Ooh, it's got to be wrong. It's got to be wrong. Unfortunately, that's kind of the theme in our movement somewhat. And in my view, as the years have passed, it hasn't served us well. One of the reasons why, in my view, in our movement, there are very few congregations. Very few congregations. Because there's an instinct within so many of us that you say, well, the authority says it's so, and this is what the authority says I ought to do. Pastor, I'm going to do different. I'm going to be different. I'm going to go a different direction. It hasn't served as well. Now, obviously, authorities need to be held in accountability. But that shouldn't necessarily be our first instinct, is to assume that all authority are all lying. Amen. God works in a chain of authority. And in this case, he's even working in the chain of authority of a man who is arrogant, prideful, egocentric, has not recognized Jehovah, has no interest in Jehovah, really. Total pagan. Yet God begins with him. So God show, works through authority, even the unconverted. Even the unconverted. Now we're going to see, as, as we go through the chapters, that God was bringing Nebuchadnezzar to a point where he would recognize Jehovah. And, and, and now, there's no indication, as I've read through the book of Daniel, I see no indication that, ne that Nebuchadnezzar ever came to genuine repentance in the sense that he said, I really want to know God and know Jehovah. I want to have a personal relationship with him. But you will see that God, Jehovah, Nebuchadnezzar, by stages, bang, 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 bang. It's going to take a few chapters. Eventually God brings this man, this, this great ancient Napoleon, to his knees. Way, way down. So that Nebuchadnezzar is compelled to say, there is a God in heaven. It's the God of Daniel. Now why would that be useful and important? God is interested in his people Israel. I believe mean, God did this and worked through Nebuchadnezzar. So that Nebuchadnezzar would provide a protective umbrella for the children of Israel in their dispersion. And that tells us about something. When God divorced Israel, he didn't cut them off and throw them in the trash can. Man. Well, maybe he did. He did cut them off, and he threw them in the trash can, but he remembered where he put them. <laughs> and when, the, when he threw them in the trash and put the lid on, he put a straw in there so they could breathe. Oh. That, well, that's a silly oh. analogy. But you get the point. God sent Israel into dispersion and divorce, and God was displeased with them, yet his love for them was not so great that he utterly forgot about them. And he said, I'm going to... I'm going to give you a little protection and a little bit of a little aid and comfort and help in this time of distress. And there was enormous distress that the children of Israel were under in Babylon and in subsequent times. But God didn't utterly leave them bereft. He worked through the, the, this pagan king who was over them in the land of Babylon to, to give them a measure of protection support. And you'll see that as we go through the book of Daniel. In fact, you could uh, see this a little bit in, uh, oh, let's see here, chapter 2, verse verse 47. And it might be good to pause now as we kind of begin our wind down with the time I've got left. Turn with me to 
back to chapter 2, verse 47. We really need to kind of focus a little bit on, on Nebuchadnezzar's response to all of this now. Let's see if we can find this. In verse 47, this is what the king, Nebuchadnezzar, says to Daniel. He says, the king answered and Daniel said, Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Now, this is not what Nebuchadnezzar had expected would happen when he laid this trap for the religious leaders of his time. He expected to destroy them. But he got a surprise, didn't he? They were discredited. But someone else was given credit. And God was given great recognition and power. And even Nebuchadnezzar recognized this. He began to recognize the power of God. <clears throat> and he provided protection for the Judeans under his dominion. Protection. Well, let's look at some other responses to the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar, in his response, he gives credit to God. We see that in verse 47. We also see <clears throat> in verse, mm, well, let's go to uh, Daniel on a personal level. <clears throat> On a personal level, we see that Daniel, of course, gives credit to God. Daniel gave credit to God way back in verse 28. We see that Daniel also is very humble about this. We really don't see a, a strong measure of pride in Daniel's life. In fact, we see that Daniel remains humble and modest. But there are some immediate political results that have bearing on the chapter that follows when we get to it. Notice verse 48 and verse 49, the very last verses of the chapter. Verse 48 says, The king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, made him a ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel is vaulted to one of the highest positions in the kingdom. One of the highest positions. That key province in the center of the empire, Daniel's made governor. What a position of authority Daniel now has that he can use for who? All of the other children of Israel who were percolating into this empire. Remember I told you Daniel was the first of three waves of captives. Daniel was taken to Babylon to make it easier for the Israelites that were going to be coming to Babylon years later as slaves first. And then they would rebuild their lives. And Daniel was there to make that transition easy. In God's providence, a lot like the providence that God had over Joseph. Joseph went into Egypt to prepare the way for Jacob's family that was going to come later. Daniel was brought there first. and had to go through all these difficulties and trials. Terrible disappointments. Some limitations. But also wonderful Wonderful usefulness for God's great purposes. In verse 49, that's not all. Notice, Daniel requested of the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So Daniel had continual access to the king, and his three friends were given exalted positions of authority as well. So now Daniel was in a position to 